Well, if you are just now joining with us uh, and uh, weren't here just a minute ago, uh, maybe somebody invited you. We're just so glad that you're here this morning. My name is Dave Jacobson. I'm one of the pastors here at City on a Hill, and we're going to get into God's Word right now. And so I'd encourage you to find your copy of Scripture. Uh, Hopefully you have one around. If you don't, you can grab a device and uh, download one or find um, an app. There's lots of options available, but you can begin making your way uh, to the Psalms. We're going to be in Psalm 91 this morning. Hey, we are in this series that we're calling What Now? Responding to Life's Uncertainty. And uh, this has been a series for us that has uh, just been really timely. And uh, we're just kind of looking at some of the things that we're walking through, some of the things that we're experiencing and seeing what does God's word have to say to us in that. And one of the verses that's been sort of um, kind of a banner over this whole series has been Proverbs 12, 25, which says this, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. I don't know about you, but I find myself often during these days returning to the Psalms. I've spent more time um, in the Psalms, continue to come back to that. And that's where we're at this morning. Uh, The Psalms do such a good job of capturing some of the emotions, some of the wrestling perhaps that we're doing in this uh, series right now. And so today uh, we're going to be looking at this responding to troubles. And uh, we, as I already said, are in Psalm 91 and certainly uh, 2020 has been a year of trouble. Uh, In this country, uh, we began the year with uh, some political unrest. And uh, do you even remember the beginning of the year uh, with the impeachment trials and all of that? And then quickly this whole COVID-19 thing gained some speed, not just uh, in our country, but around the world. Uh, We started uh, seeing and responding to that. And now um, certainly we are feeling and seeing the effects of this virus and the disease that it brings. And I'm sure by now many of you, if not all of you, know someone uh, who has uh, been sick because of this. Uh, Many of you uh, probably know someone perhaps who has um, died as a result of uh, this disease. And 2020 has brought with it just its share of troubles. Now we're beginning to see the economic impact that uh, being kind of locked down and in quarantine has provided. At this point in our country, 30 million have already filed for unemployment. That number continues to rise. Just last week, 3.8 million more uh, applied for unemployment. Globally, though, um, there is just all sorts of other trouble that we're seeing. Have you heard about the locusts over in the Horn of Africa that are eating up crops and are going to be causing all sorts of mass famine. Um, I read uh, recently about this hornet that has been kind of making its way through North America and is causing all sorts of destruction. What is going on right now? There is certainly trouble. But here's the thing is that this crisis did not bring with it trouble for the very first time, right? We are not strangers to trouble. And when all of this passes, and I hope it passes sooner than later, there will still be trouble that you and I are going to face, right? We face all sorts of health crises. We have all sorts of uh, things that we um, are worried about, are scared about, encounter. Uh, Death is a very real reality and that's not going away. Uh, There are plenty of us who are perhaps in unsafe environments, It breaks my heart to read about just what even this crisis and being at home has produced. The amount of domestic abuse reports have rose. The uh, number of calls to suicide hotlines has continued to skyrocket. The Uh, Those that are seeking out food and coming to uh, food pantries. We have one just outside of our church and that is accessed frequently. There are so many unsafe environments that are happening. People are turning to all sorts of things. Pornography is on the rise. Uh, Liquor stores are reporting uh, just rising sales through all of this. And uh, there are other troubles that you and I face the relationship uh, issues that we encounter, the difficulties that we have with those who we love or those whom we know or those whom we work with. You see, we are facing trouble now, but we're gonna continue to face trouble when it is all over. And so for you, the biggest, brightest bulb on your dashboard might be this COVID-19. 
It might be this current season that we are in, but let's all be sure that when this passes, there are other things that are gonna continue to come up. Other emergency lights are gonna continue to go off. And I wanna make sure that we are prepared to encounter those. And so great, I'm so grateful that God's word has the encouragement and has the promises that we need. And that's what I wonder this morning is where do we turn in times of trouble? We should turn to the promises of the protection of God. And Psalm 91 is one of those such psalms. We don't have any uh, background on Psalm 91. We don't know when it was written or who wrote it. But we have in this is just one of the most amazing declarations of God's promise of protection that we find in all of scripture. This is a great Psalm to memorize. What I wanna do is I just wanna walk our way through it as we get started here now. Look at Psalm 91 verse one, it says this, he who dwells in the shelter of the most high will abide in the shadow of the almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Already we see the personal character, the personal nature that the psalmist is writing with. I mean, how often do you call things mine or uh, that belong to me? Here the psalmist is saying it's my God, my refuge, my fortress. He continues in verse three, he says, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, which it symbolizes those who want to cause trouble, those who would seek uh, your life or seek to harm you in some way, but also look at this, and from the deadly, deadly pestilence. That is what we are facing right now. It's a epidemic, uh, virally transmitted, contagious disease that is wreaking havoc. And I know that I've read the reports too, that it's not maybe as bad as they predicted, but it's still bad. This thing is a real thing that we are facing right now. But he says in verse four, here's the promise of protection. He says, he will cover you with his pinions, his feathers. This picture of like a, a bird with its young and he under his wings will find you refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. noonday. There is no need for fear in these things. We continue in verse seven. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the most high, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague shall come near your tent. Verse 11, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all his ways. On their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You see what he's saying there that he's raising up, that he has a host of angels that are protecting you to the point of keeping you from stubbing your toe. You will tread on the lion and the adder. That's a snake for those of you who aren't into, you know, animals and stuff. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. And this is God himself speaking. He finishes this Psalm with an exclamation point as he declares this. He says, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty great, doesn't it? The promises of protection that God offers. But even as we're reading it, I wonder if you have sort of the same feeling or the same question that I have sometimes. Is it true? Is that really what God does? Because as I look around, it seems that I've stubbed my toe time and time again. Uh, I continue to face troubles. I continue to have reason to fear is that really true? Is God, is God really keeping his word here? Because it would seem that this Psalm is saying some things that it doesn't actually, God doesn't actually deliver on. Is that what's going on 
here. And here's the thing that I think we might have the tendency to do. I think we have the tendency to apply this psalm and understand it incorrectly and expect things from God that he is not saying he will do. You see, the devil did this with Jesus himself. He used this psalm. Do you remember when uh, Satan tempted Jesus after his days in the wilderness and, and he came to him and he took him high up on the temple and he said, he quoted verses 11 and 12. He said, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways on their hand. They will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. And so he tempted and called Jesus to jump off and to throw himself and trust that the angels would save him. And what was Jesus' response? We do not test the Lord our God. That is not what he was saying. And so I think the tendency that you and I have when we encounter the promises of God are just like what the devil did is to try and twist them or get them to some say something that they're not saying. That's not what it was saying there. And so what is it saying? What are the promises of God? What good are they for us now? What are the promises of his protection and how can we cling to them in times of trouble? Well, that is what exactly what we wanna look at today. We wanna answer this question in our time together. What do God's promises of protection in times of trouble produce in us? When we find ourselves in times of trouble, what do God's promises of protection produce in us? us. And we're going to see four things that these promises produce in us. Let me show them to you. Here's the first one. It's the awareness of our dependency on him. This is the first thing that it produces in us. Look at your copy of scripture. Look at verses uh, nine and 10. It says, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the most high who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague shall come near your tent. Notice the psalmist here has made the Lord God his dwelling place. That is the place of protection that God has given. And the thing that it produces in us is the assurance of our dependency on him. You see, sometimes I think you and I forget that. Let me illustrate it this way. Um, I have, I've, I speak about them often because, uh, well, one, I'm with them a lot right now, but they're a pretty fantastic part of my life. I have five children and I love each of them very much. And there have been some sweet uh, times that we've shared through this unique season that we are in. And as a dad, I love to provide for my kids. Uh, they uh, live in the house with us. They all have a room not their own room, mind you, we have five, uh, but they do have a room to sleep in. In that room is a bed, in that room is clothes for them to wear. When they come to the table, there is food to eat on it. There are even toys that they are able to play with. There is a yard for them to run in. There are things that as a dad in our home, I have been able to provide for them. Uh, more than that, I've been able to also provide shelter for them. Uh, this is uh, Wisconsin, right? And we have long, cold winters and inside the house, it is warm. And in the summer, it is cool. And when it's raining, it is dry. And when they need something, they know that they can come to me as their dad and they will be able to receive the provision that they need. And they depend on me for those things. There's nothing that they can do in and of themselves to uh, provide those things for themselves. But here's the thing. If one of my kids decide that they want to go it on their own and they want to leave the house and they want to uh, run away, um, which by the way, if my, I think my children are probably watching and, and part of this right now, that's a terrible idea. Okay, kids, let's just be clear about that. That's not going to go well for you because here's what's going to happen. As soon as they leave my house, and leave the house that my wife and I have provided for them, the, the dwelling place that they are in, they are outside of our protection. You see the protection that we're offering them, the, the goodness that they find in our home is available to them in our home. Should they choose to run from it, should they choose to go somewhere else, then that protection will no longer be there for them. Not that they could never come back, but that they won't find it there. And you see, this is a really, really good and important point that we understand. 
is that the protection of the Lord is found in his dwelling place. You see, you and I are dependent upon our heavenly father. And how much of our lives do we spend running from this truth, convincing ourselves that we don't need him, that we can do it without him, that we're good enough on our own. And the truth is this, is that we are not. There is one thing that the troubles that we are in and then his promise of, pro- of protection is producing in us. It is assuring us of our dependency upon him. Jesus told the story, the parable. Do you remember that of the prodigal son that wanted his inheritance early and he ran away only to find that everything came crashing down on him. And he realized that the goodness of his family, the goodness of his dad was found back home. And so he made his way back and he found his dad waiting for him with open arms and he was welcomed back with a feast. I just want to paint that picture for you of your heavenly father. There are times, and for others of us, maybe all the time, that we try and run from the dwelling place of the Lord and expect that it's going to go well for us. And I just want to tell you, it is not. It is not. The refuge that you and I found is found in the dwelling place of the Lord. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague shall come near your tent. We find protection in the dwelling place of the Lord. But let's just be clear about this. What that is saying is that protection is provided, but that does not mean that it's going to keep us from any and all trouble. Scan your eyes down to verse 14. It says, because, this is God speaking again, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. Look at verse 15. When he calls me, I will answer him. I will be with him, where? In trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The psalmist there says, and he acknowledges, it's not that God will keep you from all trouble, but what? But that he will be with you in your trouble. You see, we have dependency on God in the midst of the trouble that you and I come across. And one of the things that this dependency is producing in us is a greater knowledge of the one who made us. That's why Jesus said to his followers in Luke 21, verse 16, it says, you will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you, they will put to death. You will be hated by, for, by all for my name's sake. But look at this, but not a hair of your head will perish. How is that possible? How can you die, but not a hair on your head will perish Look at verse 19, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. See, what he's saying is there is something greater that's going on here. By your endurance through these trials, by your endurance through these troubles, that God, though it looks like your life is taken from you, the hairs on your head will not perish. He is keeping you. You are dependent upon him. And Jesus never promised a life free of pain. Rather, the confidence to not have despair when that pain comes. You see, this is what that pain can produce in us. It's this, John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that you know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is the essence of what eternal life is, is that we know God, that we know who he is and our dependency upon him. And I think we spend so much of our time, so much of our energy trying to avoid pain. And the simple fact is this, is that we can't avoid the pain of this world. We just can't. As hard as you try, you're not going to be able to avoid it. But I'll tell you this, the one thing that pain is going to produce in you, it's going to produce an assurance of your dependency upon God. And that is a very, very good thing. We need We are in our best place when we are dependent upon our heavenly father. Here's the second thing that this this promises of protection provide in us, that produce in us. Number two, it's, it's this, is that it provides this trust that he is working out things for good. He's working out things for good. Look back at Psalm 91 and verse three. 
he makes this promise. He says, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. You see the uh, versatility, the all encompassing of that. Those who would seek to harm you and those that maybe you just come from natural disaster or from just this world that we live in. But either way, verse four, he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings, you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. How? How can you not fear any of those things, knowing that they still might befall you, that trouble still will come? Well, it is the truth that we find in this verse, Romans 8, 28. Do you know this? We love to quote this verse. It says this, that we know that those who, were, who love God all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You see the word that's used there for all things means exactly what you think it does. It means all things. God is working all things out for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. And we love this verse. We love to quote this verse. You probably have this verse memorized. You've probably looked at this verse in difficult times, but do you know what his good purpose is? Do you know what he's working all these things out in you for? It's the next verse that comes after it, verse 29. All these things are working for this. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to what? To be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. See, the way he's working all these things out is that you would be conformed to the image of his son. You see, God is producing something in you through the trouble, through the pain, through the trials, through the danger that you are walking through. And that is good, good news. Again, we spend so much time avoiding the pain, but oftentimes it is the very pain that produces the most good in us. How many examples do we see of this throughout scripture? Think about the early church. They were so persecuted and attacked and chased down for their faith and for the truths that they claimed about Jesus Christ. And yet what happened? The gospel went forth. The church grew. The church flourished. People were sent out and the gospel spread to the surrounding countries. You see, through the pain, we see God produced even more good. Is that not what the cross is? Is that not what the cross did? The cross of Christ, that is Jesus hung on that tree, his life taken from him, his death on that cross. That is the worst event that has happened in all of human history. There is nothing that compares to the killing of the son of God. And yet what came as a result? The greatest good. Out of the worst evil, God produced the greatest good. It was from the death of Jesus Christ that you and I can find forgiveness of sin and salvation in him through his resurrection and life. That is the amazing truth of the gospel that through all things, God is working all things out for the good of those who have been called according to his purpose. And so listen, the reason that you and I can have confidence in this time of uncertainty right now is that we know that God is using even this. And let's be clear about it. God uses hard things, painful things that in no way minimizes the difficulty that we're walking through, that you're walking through. There is real pain that you're experiencing. And so in no way am I minimizing in any sense the pain that you are experiencing right now. But what I am trying to tell you, and I hope you hear from me in the most loving way that I can, God can and will use this pain for your good and for his glory. He is really, really good at doing that. He's the best there is. This is what our God does. He takes and uses our pain for our good. You see, there is a confidence that comes in knowing this truth. 
And some of you, even now, you can look back on some of the painful things that you've walked through and you don't have to think hard or think long to remember a time that was so, so hard to walk through, yet God used that for good in your life. Some of you even now, in this safer at home time that we are in, in this shutdown of everything, though it's not what you would have chosen, it's not, certainly hasn't been easy, you can already see some of the good things that it is producing in you. We see this in our home, some of the time that we've been able to spend with our family, some of the things that we've been able to accomplish and do, some of the time that I've been able to spend with the Lord and the way that this season has caused me to reevaluate and rethink about some things. It is producing good in me. I see that. What I would say is if already from your limited vantage point, you can see the good that God is producing, how much more when you look back from eternity and see this season, see this time, see the trouble that has yet to come to you, how much are you gonna be able to understand that God used that for his good in your life? If that's the case that's coming, if that's, if that's the future that awaits us, then why don't we just believe that now? And lean into that now and trust that God is using the trial for your good. This is the good news that Jesus came to show us through his cross. And that is the truth of this psalm is this. This is the third thing that it produces in us is that this, it's an ultimate fulfillment through the cross of Christ. All of these things, all of these promises, every statement here in this psalm is fulfilled 100% through the cross of Jesus Christ. And like you, as I read through this and I see that he will deliver me from the snare of the fowler, he'll deliver me from the deadly pestilence, that he will command his angels concerning me, that he'll guard me in all my ways, that I won't even stub my toe. How does he do this? What is, how does he accomplish this? He accomplishes all these things through his son, Jesus Christ, and his work upon the cross. You see, it was on that cross that Jesus bore the full weight of evil, the full weight of sin upon himself. The wrath of God was poured out. The wrath of God that you and I deserved was poured out on Jesus Christ, and he took it all on himself, and yet he defeated sin. He defeated death when he rose from the grave. And so listen, church, all of these promises, everything in here will come to fulfillment someday because of the work that Jesus Christ has done on the cross. This is the good news that you and I cling to. We may see it in limited form now, but we will see it fully someday, those of us who believe upon the promise of Jesus Christ. I wonder, have you ever made that decision? You see, Jesus died, but you have to receive his death. You have to receive the forgiveness that comes through his work on the cross. It says that he's working all things out for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Are you responding to that call even now? Some of you are just hoping on uh, chance. Uh, You've got your fingers crossed and you're just waiting for this to pass. And I just want to tell you that that's not good enough. You need something bigger. You need something stronger. You need a more sure foundation than that. And the foundation is Jesus Christ and the work that he has done on the cross. Do you believe it? Have you received his forgiveness, his work for your own life? Have you made that decision to follow him as Lord and Savior? He's calling you to do that even now. The reason why we come back to that, the reason why we beat that drum time and time and time again here at this church is this, is that all of that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. There is no other place that we are gonna find the full fulfillment of his promises apart from the work that Jesus did. That is why when you read this Psalm again and you read it in light of the cross, knowing the coming eternity, everything is different. When you understand the resurrection and what that means for us, you understand that he is coming back and that he's gonna make a new heaven and a new earth and that his children will live with him for all of eternity. And knowing about the coming resurrection changes everything. It changes the way that you view the trouble that you are in right now. 
one of the things that we've done in our home through this quarantine uh, fun has been, uh, we've been watching the Marvel uh, series. Uh, some of you, uh, I'm sure, have, uh, you're aware of, of this, right? It's, it's kind of, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's out there. But my kids have never watched any of them before this. What a time to be a kid, right? Disney Plus is there, and we have been making our way through the Marvel Universe. And here's the thing, for me, having seen all of the movies before, every time we sit down, the tension, the suspense, the drama that is included in this movie is just viewed through a different lens. Why? Because I know how it ends. I know what happens every single time that scene comes up. I know what the end result is going to be. And it certainly doesn't take away the drama and the difficulty for the characters. But let me tell you this, the way that I see it is totally, totally different. The same should be true for you and I. Knowing the end, knowing that Jesus is the victor, that you and I receive victory in his name should change the way that we see the trouble that we face today. There is fulfillment for all of eternity that is coming. But here's the fourth thing, and this is good news for today. You and I can experience assurance of his goodness in this life now. You see, this isn't just promises for someday. This is promises for today. Verse one, all the way back to the beginning of Psalm 91, he who dwells in the shelter of the most high will abide in the shadow of the almighty I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. We can put our trust in the Lord today for the problems that we face today, knowing that we are going to see assurance of his goodness here and now. This isn't just something that's yet to come. It is here for us now. And would we pray like David did in Psalm 27, he said this at the end of this Psalm. He said, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In the land of the living, that is today. That is right now. Wait for the Lord, be strong. Let your heart take courage, wait for the Lord. If we go back and I would encourage you to even memorize, commit to memory this Psalm. When you go back and you read it in light of this, you can see that God intends to work in your life, not just someday, but here and now. There are moments, there are times, there are occasions where we see the glimpses of his goodness. He is working in this situation now. So is it wrong to pray for protection from the disease? Certainly not. Is it wrong to pray for the loved ones that we have? No. I have prayed every day for the protection for our church, for my family, for those that I know and love, I am asking that God will provide his protection for us. But if he doesn't, I know that he is using even that for our good and ultimately it will be used for his glory. You know, I want to close with just this story. I don't know if you know about uh, Steve Saint. Uh, his father was Nate Saint, and he was one of five that were killed by a group of men that were sharing the gospel with a tribe in Ecuador. And he went back uh, to this tribe years later, and he actually met the man who killed his father. And uh, eventually, uh, this, uh, this tribe, they came to know Jesus. They put their faith and trust in Jesus. They began to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. And this man who killed his father, he was a part of the group that actually baptized Nate. This man that killed his father, he ended up being baptized by. And he was adopted. Nate was adopted, or Steve was adopted into the tribe. And he has a close relationship with this man. And here's the story that's so amazing about this is these lives were given but the whole tribe ended up being saved through that. And that has continued to ripple out and thousands upon thousands more have been impacted by the life that they gave, by the pain that they endured, by the trouble that they went through. And the truth is this, and you need to hear this, is that God can use the worst of evil for our ultimate good and for his ultimate glory. You see, sometimes we look to God and we are asking for something that he's never promised to give us. Steve Saint said it this way. He says, why is it that we want every chapter to be good? 
when God promises that only in the last chapter he will make all of the other chapters make sense. God has not promised that every chapter will be good, but he promises that in the end, every chapter will make sense. And I know we're in a confusing chapter. 2020 is a troubling year and we're only part way through. I have no idea what the rest is going to bring, but I know this is that God is working in and through it all. And we're gonna face trials and and trouble again. There's gonna be other dangers that you and I are gonna face, but God is using all of that for our good. You need to know that. You need to believe that. It makes all the difference on how you see each and every day that you're walking through right now. As we've said many times before, God doesn't promise to take the trouble away, but knowing the promises of God gives us the confidence to walk through whatever trouble you and I will face. Let me pray for you. God, even now, I just want to declare that there are times that it is difficult to believe this truth. When I see the trouble that I face, when I see the trouble around me, Lord, I know that you are there, but God, there are times that my heart forgets that. And so Lord, I just pray that you would remind us of this right now, that you would make us aware of the way that you are working, that we would see your goodness in the land of the living, that we would see your hand moving through all of this. I know that I can tell stories, God, of how you have worked in and through this season. God, the way that you have been working in this church here at City on a Hill, the way that you are drawing people to yourself. I know that there are people on this stream right now who are hearing the words of my voice that you are drawing to yourself. God, I pray that you would do a mighty work here, that we would see your glory, that we would experience your goodness in our life now. And for anyone, God, who has yet to put their faith and trust in you, I pray that they would do that right now, that they would respond to the call that you are giving them, that they would believe in the good news of the gospel, which says that Jesus died for their sin on their behalf, that they might know forgiveness of sin and life through the resurrection. Jesus, we love you and we worship you in the light of this truth. We pray all this in the name of your son, the matchless name, of Jesus. Amen.